Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. I really appreciate it. And I've enjoyed the, the, the prior talks because they really lead up to what I'm going to talk about, which is eczema with malignant T cells, otherwise known as mycosis fungoides or T cell lymphoma. Mycosis fungoides and the leukemic variant of accessory syndrome are the most common subtypes. And I'm going to let Juan Guitar do all the rest. We'll just skip those. MF is a disease that occurs only in six cases per, per million. We found hot spots in Houston, in the Houston area, where there's a hundredfold incidence of MF, suggesting that maybe there is an environmental trigger for some patients. It's more common in men and women. Our, our study, our cohort study of 1,200 patients, showed that it was just as common in men as women, except in the more advanced uh, stages, it was more common in men. Its incidence was increasing, but it, as you can see uh, here, it's kind of leveled off, according to the nice work done by Weinstein. Its average age of onset is between 50 and 60 years, but we're seeing children with MF these days and young adults. And it all uh, stems from the T cell, which in MF is, crosses the borderline between inflammatory into malignancy and which produces Th2 uh, two cytokines. Uh, we've heard about IL-13 and itching and eosinophilia. Uh, also um, IL-5, uh, IL-31 is the now thought to be the mediator of pruritus that's unrelenting and the major problem of quality of life with these patients. And uh, IL-10 uh, causes all these effects. So this is the malignant cesare cell. Uh, clinically, the disease is extraordinarily heterogeneous. These are just the major types. I haven't shown you all the variants that can occur. This is patch, less than 10% of the body, which is equal to T1. Patches or plaques, greater than 10%, T2. Cutaneous tumors, T3, and uh, erythroderma, T4. And, you, and there's uh, in decreased uh, overall survival as we move uh, to T2 and T3, and there's increased overall survival when we have plaques rather than patches, which has to do with tumor load. Now, pathologically, uh, MF requires certain criteria to exist. It has to have an atypical lymphocytic infiltrate, and there has to be epidermotrophism by def definition, and this is a Potrier's abscess where you see lymphocytes talking to Langerhan cells. Uh, patch disease has perivascular or sparse infiltrate, sometimes hard to see at all. Most of my cases of MF clinically also have spongiotic dermatitis that the pathologists don't like to have present in MF, but if it is an antigen, why not? Why couldn't you have some spongiosis? Uh, the T2, uh, this is T2 with plaques. You can also have T2 without plaques, but you're seeing in this patient, there's an epidermal hyperplasia that's identical to psoriasis, and the psoriatic MFs are very, very difficult to diagnose. And even uh, uh, gurus like Liebwal will occasionally put somebody who, th uh, who is thought to have psoriasis on an immunosuppressive agent, and that'll unmask that they have really MF. And T3 is tumors. You see that there's epidermal uh, atrophy instead of hyperplasia, and there's no epidermotrophism. The cells are all down here. Uh, and T4 is a very difficult diagnosis to make. In cesary patients, the cells have lost their epidermotrophism, so you won't see any epidermotrophism because the cells will be down here stuck around the vessels of the, of the uh, dermal vasculature, and that makes uh, it difficult to get a, a biopsy that says MF in a cesary patient means that they've probably evolved from MF to cesary syndrome. And if it's a pure de novo cesary syndrome, you won't be able to diagnose it uh, pathologically because there won't be any epidermotrophism. So just, we wrote papers on that in the past. And so to make the diagnosis, they're now uh, early uh, MF. There's an algorithm by Pimpinelli that has been uh, established, which combines clinical markers with uh, immunophenotyping and clonality to come to the diagnosis of MF. And so this is just how we work up an MF patient. And uh, we work up the patients to find their skin uh, stage. Their node stage is very complicated, but basically it goes from no cells down to um, uh, effacement of the nodes. If you think the nodes are greater than 1.5 and should be uh, involved but aren't, then that's NX. And visceral disease, MO to MUN. And 
Uh, what's been redone is the blood involvement. B0 is 0 to 250. Uh, B1 is 250 to 1,000. B2 is 1,000 atypical cells by flow cytometry in the blood. And when we put all these together and we have a staging system by TM and M. And if we sta look at the stages, uh, at the survival of the stages, uh, normal people plus uh, T1 or uh, 1A and uh, T2 with patches only look like normal people. But you start to uh, have in impact on survival in the setting of patches less than 10 or patches greater than 10. These are tumors and these are people with erythroderma. Well, this is the important slide. I don't know why it did that. <laughs> Great. OK, so um, peripheral T cell lymphomas are out here. They've, they've crossed the line. They've been to the thymus. They've gotten their college education of self versus non-self, or they've started in the bone marrow. And the, they go into either the innate immune system structure, which gives us a hepatosplenic or paniculitic-like or gamma delta or NKT lymphomas, or they become uh, CD4 positive or CD8 positive cells. And eventually, they uh, detect antigen. They clonally expand, and then they become memory cells. And for MF, there's now the thought um, or the hypothesis that cesareans are due to central memory cells, and MF is due to an effector memory cell that spends most of its life in the skin. And then we have occasionally a very rare angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma that's uh, from the TF17 um, cells. And we, we can get CD8 lymphomas, or, uh, which can be very cytotoxic and, and aggressive, or we can get um, CD8 cells with hypopigmentation in pediatric MF, which are very benign. And if we can't categorize any of these T cell lymphomas into the little win, uh, boxes that we've got for them, we just call them peripheral T cells, NOS. And these, as a, a whole, in the nodes, have a very bad prognosis uh, about 20% uh, of the patients are alive at two years. Whoops. And this is, again, the clinical heterogeneity, subcutaneous uh, lesions that look like cellulitis or paniculitis, uh, ALCL, which is primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which histologically cannot be distinguished from lymphomatoid papulosis. So we get patients who have LYP, Someone biopsies their skin, it goes to the pathologist. The pathologist reads it as anaplastic large T cell lymphoma. The patient gets excisions or radiation or even uh, chemotherapy for a disease that's not even lymphoma yet. So the pathogenesis of early MF, TANS hypothesis from 60s, uh, suggests that it's a, a disease of, of persistent antigen stimulation leading to abnormal clonal T cell population. And others have shown, like Gary Woods has shown, that as we lose the CD8 cytotoxic anti-tumor response, the disease can progress. And I'm going to show you some data suggesting that that's fast, fast ligand mediated. Loss of fast on the malignant T cells can re uh, result in the accumulation of aberrant or clonal T cells, which cause early MF. And uh, this is just something you've already seen, that the T cells can differentiate into any of these categories. Tregs are something we haven't talked about, but are, which are really Im probably important in CTCL. And um, these are the cytokines that can be made. So the uh, T cell activation and clonal expansion, alpha beta chains of the T cell receptor recognize peptides on antigen presenting cells. You've seen that already today. This induces signal transduction through the CD3 complex. There are many uh, cell proteins, SARC, SYC, T, that are phosphorylated. T uh, cytokines are produced by the T cells. And abnormal cytokine uh, expression also drives T cell proliferation. And uh, FAS and FAS ligand are important in the accumulation of the malignant T cells or the soon-to-be malignant T cells. Uh, the tumor cells lack FAS but have FAS ligand on their uh, surface. FAS and FAS ligand can um, participate in fratricide, where the tumor cell kills the CD8 cell, or in its uh, suicide, where the T cell kills itself. And um, one of the interesting things that uh, we found in our lab was a high uh, TDT, or apoptosis rate, of the epidermal keratinocytes 
in early MF lesions. And these, this is accompanied by a CD8 response that holds the tumors in chest check. So fast ligand is higher in MF lesions shown here than impaired clinically involved normal skin and, uh, and a clinically uninvolved MF skin. And you can see that the CD8 cells are also undergoing uh, fast uh, ligand mediated cell death. These are the memory cells. In areas where there are a lot of memory uh, uh, malignant cells, we have the CD8s that are undergoing apoptosis. Uh, and this is the uh, CD45 is a memory marker, and it, it, they, these malignant cells hugging the epidermis express a lot of fast ligand. The CD8s um, around here in the blue are getting killed by the uh, cells. And we've looked at cell lines of MF patients or CESRI patients, and fast ligand is highly expressed in the CTCL uh, lines. Here's the uh, western blot. And the um, cellular fast ligand is expressed in CTCL lines as well. And soluble, not so much. And here's an RNA blot. So the tumor cells express fast ligand, but not fast. We think that there are uh, methylation changes in the promoter of fast that may block expression of fast. So um, here's the, the thought of what's happening in CTCL. You've got your CTCL uh, lymphocytes. You have Langerhans cells and Potriase abscesses talking to them. And you've got a lot of CD8 tills coming in, which uh, are keeping the disease in check. But you also have uh, T cells that are coming in from the epidermis through uh, adhesion molecules. And in the early stage of MF, if you look, mostly there's Th1 cytokine production. And this changes as the disease progresses. Sorry. So one of the uh, newer recognized uh, drivers in CTCL is IL-13, and this is work that's done recently by Larissa Gaskin, who's at, uh, at uh, um, uh, Columbia, no, yes, Columbia now, and she's shown that IL-13 and its receptors are highly expressed in CTCL lesions, co-expression of CD4 and TOX, which is thymus high mobility uh, group protein in the skin and the blood of CTCL patients produces IL-13 and expresses both receptors. IL-13 induces T cell growth in vitro and signaling through its receptor, and it's a newly reported autocrine growth factor for CTCL cells. So uh, after the initial uh, antigen-stimulated response, uh, there can be mutations in the T cells that then lead to a malignant phenotype. These include, besides fast, fast ligand loss of apoptosis and accumulation, Problems with JAK-STAT inhibitor uh, pathways, uh, which suggests that some of the JAK-STAT inhibitors might be helpful here. This leads to NF-kappa B signaling, and many of the agents we've studied have disrupted the NF-kappa B pathway. There's profound chromosome instability in CESRI cells, their DNA repair mutations. 50% of the patients have loss of P53, especially in patients with large cell transformation. And it's interesting that large cell transformation actually usually occurs on the face and neck in the sun-exposed areas, and P53 is known to be mutated by light. Mutations in P16, P14 give, and then growth advantage genes uh, include CMYK, and driver mutations in the AKT pathway, the RAS-ERK pathway, uh, which is also implicated, of course, in BRAF melanoma. And now we're finding that uh, MF may be driven by miRNA, and there are studies looking at uh, inhibitors of miRNAs that are exciting and new. So histologically, uh, MF can progress. About 1 in 10 1A patients progress to advanced stages. Uh, this shows large cell, cell transformation, which is a pathologic diagnosis of, uh, lymphocyte, um, of the lymphocytes having nuclei that are four times the normal size. So large cell transformation is a descriptive, a descriptive pathological term and uh, what we hope to do in the future is sort out some of the drivers in large cell compared to uh, regular stage MF and CESRI syndrome. So we can get tumors, we can get um, large cells in the skin, we can get refractory disease that doesn't respond to therapy, we can get spread to blood called CESRI or systemic uh, transformation in nodes. I'd like to talk a few minutes about CESRI syndrome. 
This is defined as erythroderma greater than 80% of the surface of the body, or T4. Uh, it has to have more than uh, 1,000 Cesare cells in the blood, and we measure Cesare's at our place by looking at CD4 positive, 26 negative, or 4 positive, 7 negative cells by flow cytometry. We don't count Cesare cells any longer. Um, it's characterized by severe pruritus, and, and our work has shown that it, it's associated with colonization of Staph aureus at 60%, which is identical to that of atopic dermatitis patients. And when we can get the skin clear of Staph by bleach baths or acetic acid rinses or antibiotics, the patients have uh, partial responses. So it's part of the driving of the immune system by Staph superantigens or uh, re re the reaction of T cells to the uh, staph antigens that are part of this disease, uh, chicken and, and egg situation. They also get ectropion from the pulling of the skin down, and they get hand foot care to derma. And um, we did a medical student uh, trial where every Cesare patient who walked into the clinic had an exam of their feet and KOH uh, examination, and 60% of them with keratoderma have tinea present on their scrapings. So this is another antigen uh, where, which may be causing problems in this disease. And uh, I, I mentioned that Cesare syndrome pathologically is very difficult to diagnose because all the cells are down here and there's no epidermotropism. Um, and morphologically, the cerebriform morphology was, rec was first recognized by Cesare, a, a French dermatologist, and we don't really know yet what that cerebriform uh, nucleus means. Why is it cerebriform? Why are they bigger? There are uh, too many chromosomes in many of the Cesare patient's cells, and Dr. Cupper and Rachel Clark have shown that they're memory T cells. I'm, I'm going to just, I mentioned uh, flow cytometry already. We found um, that this was very helpful in, in diagnosing patients. And if you see here, the aberrant T cells uh, are uh, present for CD3, for CD7 negative, and CD26 negative. And if we look at the blood, it, it makes a difference in overall survival. If your blood is B0 to B1, less than 250 Cesare cells, you have a pretty good overall survival. But if you have B2, which is greater than 1,000, or a new category called B3, which is greater than 10,000 Cesare cells, you have uh, decreased survival. Um, and we have found that um, our uh, Cesare patients no longer live 2.5 years unless they have B3, but have gone out here and now they live over five years. And I have Cesare's alive at 20 years of treatment, and some in complete remission after allogeneic stem cell transplant. So another interesting thing is you cannot make Cesare patients stop itching. Uh, gabapentin is useful clinically, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. But there's new uh, work that um, CD31 or PCAM is produced by C TD, uh, TH2 cells and mature dendritic cells. If you inject it into skin or brain, it causes severe itching and atopic lesions in mice. And um, dorsal root ganglia co-express CD31RA and uh, receptor potential ch cation channel, in a which is a vanilloid subtype. And this work was recently uh, published in an allergy journal. Um, so the, another study done in mice, uh, presented in Nature Medicine uh, a couple of months ago, shows that the reactive state of uh, astrocytes in the dorsal horn of the spinal segments or co correspond to itch. And actually, this may relate to why many people itch on their back and their upper back. Um, the, the, this is a state mediated by STAT3 and, and can be blocked. So maybe the STAT inhibitors will be important in itching. In my experience, uh, antihistamines do nothing for the itching of CTCL and are a waste of time because it's not a histamine-related itch. If you inject uh, GRP, uh, you can also increase itch, especially um, with lipocalin-2 injections, and that, that's an interesting new thing. Another uh, focus of our research and, the, and many other uh, CTCL centers is to look at the molecular genetics abnormalities of people with Cesare syndrome. There's a loss of chromosomes, and there's a gain of other chromosomes. Interesting, uh, P17 is, is increased, and P17 is where P53 is, and uh, 17Q is decreased, and that's where all the stat genes are. 
So that we're beginning to see correlations between loss and gain of chromosome functions and actual genetic loci. There mu in, um, there's loss through mutations and deletions of tumor suppressors, um, P53, P15, P16, and there's hypermethylation, there's microsatellite instability that you see as in colon cancer. And we've had a number of patients who present with MF, but they have a secondary malignancy, and colon cancer is one of the more frequent ones. There's increased uh, expression of tumor promoters, like June B, PAC, RAF, STAT signaling, NF-kappa B is very important. AKT, and we're starting to do AKT inhibition in a new protocol, and also ras erp So uh, these are the NCI guidelines for initial treatment of CTCL. Basically, uh, if you've got early stage disease, you use skin-directed therapy. If the patients become refractory or more involved, you add biological response modifiers, phototherapy, interferon, retinoids. If you become a tumor patient, you need a radiation for a single tumor, or if there are multiple tumors, then you're into uh, debulking agents like ONTAC or uh, chemotherapy, monochemotherapy. Um, and if you've got stage four Cesare syndrome, patients get combination immunotherapy first and then targeted therapy second, or an allogeneic stem cell transplant, or the non Cesare's with visceral disease get chemotherapy. And um, denylukin dif diftotox or ONTAC targets the T cell receptor, gets in through binding to the T cell receptor, and then poisons the cells. And it's, um, we've just finished phase three trials showing that it's superior to um, placebo at two different doses. Another uh, thing that you may not have heard about, there's an anti-human CD3 immunotoxin uh, that is, targets CD3 and lets diphtheria toxin in CD3-bearing cells. And CD3 is on all T cells, so it's much more uh, less selective than, than denylukin diftotox. Another uh, ta uh, targeted therapy, it targets the CCR4 receptor. It's an antibody that targets it. it it's highly expressed in, in ALCL and transformed MF and in peripheral T cell lymphomas. It's called mogulizumab, and it's the first um, <coughs> defucalized, defucalized antibody, and it's improved in uh, Japan for HTLV1 anaplastic, I'm sorry, uh, adult T cell lymphomas. And uh, if you remove the fucose gr group on the antibody, it, it, it increases ADCC potency. This is one of my patients who was in the phase one, two trial, a 66-year-old man treated for over a year. He got a partial response in his blood quickly at the end of the first course and got a CR uh, that lasted for three years. You can see here his MSWAT fell from 120 to zero and the cells in his blood quickly uh, normalized by the, the first course. And if you look at his flow, uh, you see that uh, we're getting rid of um, his cells. We're getting rid of his T regulatory cells, which happen to be the malignant clone. We're getting rid of his CCR4 uh, T regs. And we're leaving his uh, suppressor CD8 cells intact which is, these are all desirable things for treating a Cesare patient. So um, an, an 11 out of 12 patients with blood involvement had complete remissions in their blood, which is extraordinary. They also, uh, anti-CCR4 uh, also decreased CD4 regs that were present in the patients at baseline and then after treatment. So it got rid of the T regs, suggesting that it could be an active agent in other forms of cancer, like breast, colon, prostate, where there's a T regulatory inhibition of tumor killing. Um, what's interesting about these agents is the antibodies almost all call, cause a spongiotic dermatitis. And this also may be due to uh, taking out the T regs. We don't know. Uh, in the last few minutes, uh, a minute or so, I'm going to talk about CD30, uh, which can be in MF or it can be in ALCL or LYP. And, uh, and there's a spectrum of CD30 uh, clinical features from LYP all the way to Hodgkin's lymphoma. These all express CD30. PTCLs, AT, uh, the HTLV1 anti, uh, lymphoma, and of course, transformed MF. Uh, but you can have CD30 without transforming your MF. 
And rituximab vedotin is a, a conjugated antibody. It has a tubulin inhibitor called MMAE uh, on its surface, and the antibody gets in through the CD30 receptor, and it poisons the cell uh, uh, tubulin, and the cell dies, and you get responders of all uh, CD30, 73% response rate, 35 out of 48, which is extraordinary. None of our other drugs work this well. 100% of the ALCL or LYP lesions had responses. There was only one progressive disease in an LYP patient who kept getting flares. But this is, an, for the MF patients in the study, 54% of them had responses. This is a patient who had uh, lymphomatoid papulosis and MF. Their LYP went into remission. Their, MR, uh, their MF got a partial response. This is the MSWAT. These are the LYP lesions that we counted. And interestingly, we did a, a corollary a translational study in this patient and, and 11 others. We looked at the pink patch that was the MF, and we looked uh, for standing for CD3, CD4, CD8, and CD30. And we did an LYP lesion. You can see the wedge-shaped wedge infiltrate, the high proliferation of CD4 and CD30 match pretty well. And then we did gene arrays, or, or sequencing of clones, rather. And we found that the patch of MF and the, and the papule of um, LYP had exactly the same uh, T cell beta and gamma um, receptors. So this suggests to me that what you see clinically in MF, where there's little bits of T cells along the epidermis, and LYP, where you get a dense wedge, are the same disease. It's just that they're the same clone uh, of this T cell receptor. And what we're seeing is just tumor load. And um, fortunately, uh, the, the patients with LYP have self-regression of their lesions. So these are some of the potential targets for therapy. It's an incomplete list, but I'll just leave it up there. And Pat uh, is going to talk about therapy in more depth. We did genetic genomic sequencing in 37 patients. They have heterogeneous driver mutations. They have, um, they have a UV pattern of, of uh, mutations, which is kind of interesting, and we hope our paper gets accepted. Uh, the Stanford group just published their paper in Nature Genetics looking at TNF2 uh, receptor which is mutated in, CT, in, in CESRI uh, and MF patients, much more so in um, MF than um, in CESRI. And these are just some of the biomarkers that have led to therapies that, it, that are undergoing trials at this time. So cutaneous lymphomas are heterogeneous clinically and pathologically, and this is reflected at the molecular level. It's a challenge because there's so many genes that are involved in Pathology really is the key for the diagnosis and for selecting the most effective therapies for our patients. And we need to know, use pathology tools to understand the pathogenesis and develop new target proteins on the malignant cells that can be used for, top, for novel therapies, maybe cure the patients with less toxicity and higher response rates. Thank you very much.